Welcome back to Intro to Philosophy 1010. In this video, I'll be going over W.E.B. Du Bois' Of Our Spiritual Strivings, which was, it's from a collection of essays from 1903 called The Souls of Black Folk. So, if you read that introductory paragraph by Richard Bilsker, you'll learn that Du Bois was a founding member of the NAACP, and the first African-American to graduate from Harvard with a PhD. And he studied with William James at Harvard, uh, which is also who George Herbert Mead studied with, uh, with William James. And there's similarities between Mead's concept of the self and Du Bois. So this is the uh, second to last reading in part one of our book, of four fundamental questions. This fundamental question is who or what am I? And we saw Mead say the self is an object to itself. You have to get outside of yourself and see yourself objectively as an object. And how do you do that? By imagining how you appear to be from other people's perspective. So the self is a social construct, he says. It's created by interactions in society and symbolic language is the prerequisite for that social construct. And at the end of his essay, Mead talked about, um, at the top of page 116, he said, normally within the sort of community as a whole to which we belong, there is a unified self, but that may be broken up, and disassociations are apt to occur, or apt to take place, this is lower on page 116, when an event leads to emotional upheavals, that which is separated goes on its own way. The unity and structure of the complete self reflects the unity and structure of the social process as a whole, and each of the elementary selves of which it is composed reflects the unity and structure of one of the various aspects of that process. So the structure of the complete self is thus a reflection of the complete social process. So Mead said, it's natural for a person to be to have multiple personalities because you have a different personality that responds to the different social groups in the society to which you belong. <clears throat> and normally there's a unified self when all the different roles that you have to play to engage in society work together. But disassociations, you're, you can have a kind of a schizophrenic break if all of the different separate roles you play aren't integrated properly. So the self reflects the society. The structure of the self reflects the structure of society. Plato says the same thing in the Republic, although this part of the Republic we read doesn't talk about that. But that um, Mead is saying a lot when he says that the structure of each individual psychology reflects the structure of society. And now getting back to Dubois, he's giving an example of what happens to someone who's raised in a society when there's one whole segment of society that is brutally oppressed. And even though he's writing 40 years after uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, 40 years after slavery was officially ended, in the United States, what he talks about is what's been the progress of the, well, he's calling this the spiritual strivings of African Americans, of black Americans being raised in predominantly white America. What effect has that had? And where does it leave them 40 years after the Emancipation Proclamation? 40 years after slavery, how has the historical progress of what he'll refer to as the black race progressed? And it's just important to keep Mead's perspective of the self in mind while reading Dubois, because they were both influenced by William James at their time at Harvard. So I will start with the discussion question one on page 127, because it addresses the very beginning of the reading, and it's just good to keep this question in mind. So what does Dubois mean by the veil and double 
consciousness. The veil he talks about a couple of times and double consciousness. So in the beginning on page 121, he talks about growing up in New England and it was actually Great Barrington, Massachusetts. In, in, out in the forested areas, not in the city. And he didn't really have a consciousness of being different from the other kids, even though he was apparently the only black student. He wasn't aware of it until one day the children had got it into their minds to exchange visiting cards, 10 cents a package, gorgeous visiting cards, I guess like Valentine's Day card exchanges today, something like that. So as a, as a young boy, I don't know exactly how young, he handed his greeting card to this new girl. This is at the bottom of page 121. He said, the exchange was merry till one girl, a tall newcomer, refused my card, refused it peremptorily with a glance. So she said, I'm not going to take a card from you. And then he realized. So then it dawned upon me with a certain suddenness that I was different from the others or like mayhap in heart and life and longing, but shut out from their world by a vast veil. So there's the veil. When that little girl refused his greeting card because he was black, he could feel just all of a sudden, oh, there is this veil that separates me from them, that separates black America from white America. So a veil is a, if you, what's, what's a veil is it's not a brick wall and uh, it's not nothing. You can see through a veil somewhat, vaguely, there is some kind of, um, it's not a totally impermeable barrier, but so a veil. He said, I had thereafter no desire to tear down that veil, to creep through. I held all beyond it in common contempt and lived above it in a region of blue sky and great wandering shadows. So he, he dealt with the veil, he'll go on to explain, better than most of his black friends who either retreated into what he calls tasteless sycophancy or into silent hatred of the pale world. And then he goes on to ask on page 122, why did God make me an outcast and a stranger in mine own house? So why, why be born an outcast? This is his home country. This is where he was born and raised. And yet he's made to feel like an outsider, like a foreigner. The second paragraph on page 122, after the Egyptian. So here he puts what he conceives to be the world historical destiny of the black American race. He says, after the Egyptian and Indian, the Greek and Roman, the Teuton and Mongolian, the Negro is a sort of seventh son born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world which yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of the others and of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. So there you have the veil, this double consciousness. Being an American and being black. Two different identities in the same society. And being uh, an American, a Negro, two souls, two unreconciled strivings. So how do you fuse these two selves into one? He'll talk about how to do that, but first you have to take into account what has happened since slavery ended, these 40 years? So he uses the 40 years since the end of slavery, and he draws a parallel with the 40 years in the desert that the Jews spent following Moses after they were freed from slavery to the Egyptians. And we even see, he mentions the Egyptian as the first great civilization. So in his opinion, and we'll see by the, near the end of this reading, the Egyptian, the Egyptian civilization, the Indian, and he means from India, the Hindu civilization, the Greek civilization, where Plato and 
Aristotle with the crowning achievements in that in the philosophical world uh, the Roman civilization the Teutons so the German tribes conquered the Roman Empire and then the most recent world historical power in, in his assessment the Mongolian so the Negro is a sort of seventh son later he'll sh he'll say the way that black America and and white America together should each provide what the other lacks and then that would be the next great world power we'll see in a few in a few pages so discussion question one the veil is just racism in America that prevents either side from seeing the other very clearly although there it's it's, it's possible it's not an impermeable barrier but there is this obscuring barrier and then double consciousness seeing yourself from these two perspectives that are not unified so Mead says we're all we all have multiple consciousnesses because the self is made of all the roles you play in society but if the American and then having a black body if those two roles can't be fused together then you have this split so he how can you reconcile these two is going to be the problem that he addresses okay so discussion question two on page 127 Mead and Dubois were both students of William James what similarities do you find in their views of the self we've been going over that and um, I think the the most important part of Mead's uh, reading for this reading by Dubois is at the end where Mead talks about how each part of the structure of the self is a reflection of the complete social process and Dubois is showing the practical reality of that belief in the American experience especially being black uh, one thing is Dubois he he talks about having this double consciousness and he complains that it's a a waste of double aims it's it's pulling black Americans apart on the other hand if you in that sentence on page 122 the second full paragraph after the Egyptian and Indian and all these different civilizations the Negro is a sort of seventh son born with a veil and gifted with second sight so Mead says you cannot help but seeing yourself from other people's perspective so seeing yourself measuring yourself by another person's measuring tape which is what Dubois is complaining about why do I have to judge myself by white America's standards Mead would say everyone inevitably does that that's how a self is created and Dubois seems to also agree when he says gifted with second sight why why are black Americans gifted with second sight because they can see themselves from two perspectives they're Americans so they know the general American worldview but they're black Americans so they have another perspective that white Americans lack so if you become a self by seeing yourself from other people's perspectives then the more perspectives of yourself that you have access to the more of a self you can become so in some respect the curse of having this double consciousness is also a blessing because it gives extra insight into the nature of the self but on the other hand that double consciousness is pulling people apart it rips some people apart and he talks about having these double aims at the bottom of page 122 he says and yet it is not weakness it is the contradiction of double aims the double aimed struggle of the black artisan on the one hand to escape white contempt for a nation of mere hewers of wood and drawers of water and on the other hand to plow and nail and dig for a poverty-stricken horde could only result in making him a poor craftsman for he had but half a heart in either cause so if you feel ashamed to do manual labor because you come from a group of people who were forced to do that labor during slavery then you're going to have part of you is going to say I'm not going to hew that wood or draw that water because you know that, that's what you is that all that you're going to give me access to in this life on the other hand people have to do that kind of manual labor no matter 
what race you are in the world of gravity and physical objects some people have to build houses and make roads and things like that so he's just talking about how this split of black america and white america enervates the will of black americans because they just don't feel completely integrated into society and therefore they've got these two different this this desire to relate with two different sides of America, it splits their will in half and it leaves them unprepared to deal um, with life in a society competing in the daily activities with a group of people who didn't have this kind of a, of a, a crippling inheritance. So. For example, he'll say, you know, a people on page 125, he says, a people thus handicapped ought not to be asked to race with the world, but rather allowed to give all its time and thought to its own social problems. But alas, while sociologists gleefully count his bastards and his prostitutes, the very soul of the toiling, sweating black man is darkened by the shadow of a vast despair. So he, he's talking about Being a member of the black American society in the greater white American, predominantly white America. And now you have to, you're free, so you have to get along with the rest of society and compete for limited resources. And it's when you have to compete against people who have money and have a history of education whereas your history is people who are treated like property and you have no money, how, how is that really going to be a fair playing field? So he talks about these different ways that in the, in the 40 years after the end of slavery, different guiding lights that black Americans followed. On, uh, earlier on page 124, he says, so after... Um, after the end of slavery, it was the 15th Amendment, being allowed to vote. That was what was going to raise blacks to the same level as whites. But then in 1870, he talks about the revolution of 1876. It was when the last federal troops were withdrawn from the formerly Confederate states. And that enabled a lot of the voting rights of black American men to be repressed, not overtly taken off the table, but at any rate, um, reconstruction era was over, segregation was enforced more rigorously, and the ballot didn't mean as much as it did when there were federal troops in those states to enforce this equality of the races. So that ended the ballot as the ultimate way to achieve equality in America. So the next, after the ballot, he said, uh, the idea of book learning was another pillar of fire. So in the Bible, when the Jews were wandering in the desert after they were freed from the Egyptians, at nighttime they would follow, God would manifest as a pillar of fire to guide their way at night. So book learning was the, another pillar of fire um, in the middle of page 124, he says, it was the idea of book learning, the curiosity born of compulsory ignorance to know and test the power of the Kabbalistic letters of the white man, the longing to know. Here at last seemed to have been discovered the mountain path to Canaan. So then he talked about how hard it was for the first frontiersmen, black pioneers into the Kabbalistic world of literature and he says in that next paragraph about halfway in there he says if however the vistas disclosed as yet no goal no resting place little but flattery and criticism the journey at least gave leisure for reflection and self-examination it changed the child of emancipation to the youth with dawning self-consciousness self-realization self-respect in those somber forests of his striving, his own soul rose before him, and he saw himself, darkly as through a veil, and yet he saw in himself some faint revelation of his power, of his mission. So, as he began to read the great works of literature, 
he began to have a dawning self-consciousness. So this brings us back to Mead. So Dubois, now he's studying at Harvard, he's reading the classics of philosophy, he's reading about sociology, psychology, and history, and this is enabling him to look at his own situation through the lens of the white man's literature, That's his, which is how he's describing this. And in so doing, he has a dawning self-consciousness, a self-realization. And he says he, he looks darkly as through a veil. So just there's this veil that goes both ways. Now he's looking, the veil of racism, the separation of the races in America, of the black and white Americans, he can see himself looking through the books. I'd imagine he was reading most of the philosophers that we read, Plato certainly. Um, so he's needing to absorb what he's characterizing as kind of a foreign worldview and looking back as, at his life as a black American born, you know, in the 19th century and living in the aftermath of slavery. But that whole idea of perceiving yourself through other people's eyes in order to create the self. That was what Mead was teaching, and this is what Dubois is explaining, how it was his self-realization was dawning on him as he was learning to look at himself through these other worldviews. Um, so then he says, but you can't have just people with PhDs. You also have to have people capable of sustaining a society. You need plumbers and carpenters and craftsmen. So um, you need all of those. If you look down at the bottom of page 125, he says, he says, the bright ideals of the past, physical freedom, then political power, then the training of brains and the training of hands. All these in turn have waxed and waned until even the last grows dim and overcast. Are they all wrong, all false? No, not that. But each alone was over simple and incomplete. The dreams of a credulous race childhood or the fond imaginings of the other world which does not know and does not want to know our power. To be really true, all these ideals must be melted and welded into one. So he'll go on to say, work, culture, liberty. All these we need not singly, but together, not successively, but together, each growing and aiding each and all striving toward that vaster ideal that swims before the Negro people, the ideal of human brotherhood, gained through the unifying ideal of race. So that seems... So let's first analyze what he went over there. In the 40 years after the end of slavery, first black Americans received the ballot. And then when the federal troops were withdrawn from the South and political power was not as effective, the ballot wasn't as effective as it was before they left, then according to Dubois, black Americans turned to the training of higher education. And then when that was a slow progress, um, the training in just the crafts, how to be a trained, a skilled laborer. And he's saying, isolated from each other, none of them was very effective. What is required in order to achieve the promised land is to unite all of those groups of people. So he's, like me, talking about the need to integrate society into a single unifying ideal. And this is where Dubois is unique. He's talking about the ideal of human brotherhood. This is the vaster ideal, he says, that swims before the Negro people. The ideal of human brotherhood gained through the unifying ideal of race. The ideal of fostering and developing the traits and talents of the Negro, not in opposition to or contempt for other races, but rather in large conformity to the greater ideals of the American Republic, in order that someday on American soil, two world races may give each to each those characteristics both so sadly lack. And it will continue in a moment, but the unifying ideal of race, most people I think today in the 2018, in the first quarter of the 21st century, would not think that the ideal of race is a unifying ideal. It's more of a separating 
ideal. If you identify as a particular race, that in se it, it seems to imply that there isn't this human brotherhood, but he's seeing it otherwise. In order for there to be unity between the white and the black race in America, he sees that the, the Negro people, they need to become a complete self-sufficient society with an educated elite and a skilled labor force and a, a political segment of society. And then once they've got that unity they can then embrace white Americans, each giving to the other what it lacks. And so that you would then have these two world races that would be in, in some respects, one powerhouse, double-raced world historical force. This is his, his vision. When I read that first, the image that came to my mind was raking leaves. When you have a yard covered in leaves, the, what you do is you rake up the leaves into separate piles first. So you're trying to unify all those scattered leaves into one big pile. And you begin by raking up, a, you don't rake one huge wall of leaves over the whole yard. You make a pile here, a pile there. And that's just the image that came to my mind. It seems to be to me that Dubois is saying first, Black Americans need to solidify their own power. And then when that is safely unified, they can embrace the white Americans and provide what each other lacks. So what, what do they provide to each other? So he'll go on to say, we, the darker ones, come even now, not altogether empty-handed. There are today no truer exponents of the pure human spirit of the Declaration of Independence than the American Negroes. So who appreciates freedom more than black Americans? Nobody can appreciate freedom more than someone who was born in a race that was enslaved for centuries. That's his point. Then he says, there is no true American music but the wild, sweet melodies of the Negro slave. The American fairy tales and folklore are Indian and African, and all in all, we black men seem the sole oasis of simple faith and reverence in a dusty desert of dollars and smartness. Will America be poor if she replace her brutal, dyspeptic blundering with light-hearted but determined Negro humanity, or humility, or her coarse and cruel wit with loving, jovial good humor, or her vulgar music with the soul of the sorrow songs? So that's something he's saying. All right, we've been destitute, we've been enslaved. What do we have as black Americans to bring to the table if, if I'm talking about this unity of the two races? He says, well, even, even now, dealing with what we've dealt with, we bring, we're not empty-handed. And a love of freedom and true American music. I think today, looking back, it would be admitted that the most popular music in the world today is American music, which is rooted in black American music, in what he calls the sorrow songs, uh, the, the spiritual melodies of the Negro slave. <clears throat> and that has, you know, that's the, the origin of rock and roll music, which is the global music today. So <clears throat> rock and roll, meaning everything that was born out of rock and roll. So it's all rooted back to black American music. And simple reverence, a, a simple faith. The, he's saying that the black Americans have a more a pure religiosity and um, not so... The cruel wit of the white Americans needs to be tempered by the loving, jovial, good humor, what he calls Negro humility. All right, so, um, so we've gone over discussion question one, the veil and double consciousness, and the comparisons with Mead. On page 128, discussion question three, to what extent do you think race and or ethnicity shape who we are or why? So if you answer that question, I want you to compare your perspective to Dubois' perspective. You could, you know, as it stated this question, you don't need to refer to the book, but I want you to refer to Dubois' writings, 
when you answer, if this is one of the questions, because you could just say, I think race and or ethnicity doesn't shape who we are at all because, and whatever you say, if you never mention Dubois, then that's not going to, you're not going to get a good grade because the point of these questions is to test your knowledge <coughs> of the readings. So pay, uh, question four on page 128, in the middle of the essay, Dubois says, this then is the end of his striving to be a co-worker in the kingdom of culture. Explain what he means. So on page 122, the bottom paragraph, this then is the end of his striving to be a co-worker in the kingdom of culture, to escape both death and isolation, to husband and use his best powers and his latent genius. Um, in the context of the reading, when he says he wants to be a co-worker in the kingdom of culture, and keeping in mind the similarity between Dubois' philosophy and, and um, George Herbert Mead's, you become the self that you are in some respects by seeing yourself through the perspective of other people. So the way other people see you forms who you are. So you don't become a self. Um, all right, so to become a, a co-worker in the kingdom of culture, culture provides worldviews, perspectives. So if you want to take control of who you are, then you have to take account of how other people see you. And the way you can alter the way other people see you is by providing them other worldviews through which to perceive you. That's what the kingdom of what he's talking about um, in the, to be a co-worker in the kingdom of culture. And so here he is, Dubois, he's writing this, these essays, he's trying to change people's worldviews and that will help raise what Dubois calls the black race <clears throat> into a level of equality with the white race so that together um, they can each provide what the other lacks and become a more unified society. And not only that, it would seem to me, he says, the Negro is the seventh son, so the Negro is going to be the next great civilization like the Greeks and Romans and Teutons and Mongolians before. But at the end, he talks about how the, white, the two world races may give each to each those characteristics both so sadly lack. So this seventh great civilization, it seems to be some kind of a cooperation in this human brotherhood gained through the unifying ideal of race, this unity of the white race and black race, separate races that work together. It seems to be his, his worldview. And to strive to be a co-worker in the kingdom of culture is the way that he intends to change white America's perspective of black America so that there can be this cooperation. Okay, so the next reading is Existentialism by Jean-Paul Sartre. And I will come back then.